Thank you everyone for joining our webinar today. Is privacy really a tech problem and who owns it? My name is Sky and I'm on the marketing team here at Skyflow. And I'd like to introduce you to today's speakers. If you wanna go on to the next slides. Um, joining us today, we have Daniel Barber, who is the co-founder and CEO of DataGrail, which is a technology platform that helps organizations automate their privacy programs and become compliant with CCPA, GDPR, and other privacy regulations. Before DataGrail, he led revenue teams at DocuSign, Datanize, which was acquired by ZoomInfo, Tout App, which was acquired by Marketo, and Responsis, which was acquired by Oracle. He also advises several high-growth startups, including Chorus AI, Outreach IO, and Sign On Site. Also joining us today is Skyflow's co-founder and CEO, Anchu Sharma. Anchu is a serial entrepreneur and angel investor. He co-founded Clearden, where he serves as executive chairman, and Suki, a digital assistant for doctors. Before that, he served as venture partner at Storm Ventures and was vice president of platform at Salesforce. He's invested in over 25 startups, including Newtonix, Algolia, Wakato, and Razorpay. All right, Anshu and Daniel, you want to take it away? Yeah, awesome. thank you, Scott. Uh, well, I think from an agenda perspective, we've got a lot to cover today um, and uh, we'll be tag teaming as we go through it. But uh, uh, I think, you know, everyone can probably read the slide. Um, I think if folks do have questions, um, Sky, uh, we can certainly accept those and, and take those at the end. Um, anything else you wanted to share, Anshu, as we kick it off? No, I think our goal is to essentially talk about uh, how do various teams work together and solve for privacy. We come from a, two different perspectives. Uh, I think it's safe to say we are an infrastructure uh, first company and you guys are uh, definitely a compliance first company. And I think the two need to really work together. So I'm very excited to do this webinar with you because a lot of customers ask us questions about how does infrastructure compliance, security compliance, privacy compliance, SOC 2, PCI, all of this come together within their organizations and also architecturally. So excited to be doing this with you. Yeah, same guys. All right, so do you wanna just give like a high level of what, you, what you're seeing in the market where you know privacy connects? Yeah, I think um, privacy is one of those things. It's very hard to define. Um, I think we we can all sense it when our privacy is getting violated. But if I asked you to write down all the things you need to have your privacy ensured, uh, even, even people who've been in the privacy industry for 20 years can't really do it. And the reason is, um, you know, privacy is almost like a value, right? It's a value that we need to deliver to our customers. It's no different than trust. It's no different than, uh, you know, having great customer service, for example. These are not um, atomizable, distinct line items that you can check off. So what that means is as an organization, you need to have various parts of your organization come together. So from a legal perspective, for example, you need to worry about, am I really compliant with SOC 2, PCI and such? From a technology perspective, a CTO is thinking, all of these things that are happening in my environment, how do I actually tell the general counsel with a straight face that I'm actually legally following all the rules. <laughs> Meanwhile, your business guys just want to do more marketing. They want to sign up more customers. They don't want to have to have a 400 page terms of service and 14 buttons to click before you can acquire a customer or can partner. And I think the false dichotomy has been for the last five, 10 years that you can either do business or you can have privacy. And I think what Daniel and I are here to talk about is actually, you can actually have both. You can actually do business at a faster speed if you actually think through your privacy architecture the right way. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we, <clears throat> we see legal teams uh, obviously uh, trying to tackle privacy. Um, some of them are technical, some of them are not. Um, and so a partnership between technical teams and legal teams is really sort of the, the path forward. Um, and uh, obviously accommodating and, and driving ultimately business is sort of the goal, right? So I, I couldn't agree more with sort of your commentary there. And we see that consistent across our customers. Um, so, you know, we, we're talking about um, PII infrastructure and how everyone's building this. I thought 
you know, before we go into that, it could be just valuable to actually understand like, why are we, why are we doing this? Um, and I think you have an example for us, right? Yes. So we do have an example. Uh, this is a company uh, that most of us have been, especially in COVID times, have been Netflix, Netflixing and chilling, I suppose. Uh, but it's not so chill to be inside that company. Uh, one of their very senior architects uh, helped us actually put this together uh, to explain, you know, the transformation that Netflix went through. Uh, we can actually find similar examples, public examples, again, of companies like Adyen, which is a large payments company. And there's some public documentation around uh, companies like Visa and others adopting this kind of a uh, mindset around the problem and the problem is very simple you built uh, a very simple application you might think right streaming is the simplest application you can imagine um, you just have users and you stream the data but in reality behind the scenes you need to do a bunch of things you need to have hr applications you need to hire people you need to manage talent one of the most amazing things i heard from jitender aswani who's now uh, at moveworks was there's a lot of talent data that actually Netflix has, and that's how they figure out what shows actually they should be even producing. But all of that means there's a lot and a lot of information that could be considered personal information. And looking at this diagram, imagine yourself as the general counsel or as the chief privacy officer and saying, hey, when someone submits a data deletion request, are you 100% sure we can do that? Um, when um, a European authority asks us, where is your data really stored? Do you actually abide by data residency principles? Like even just figuring the basics out is incredibly hard. And there really is two approaches people have taken. And that's one of the discussions we'll have today. One is to see if you can do something very incremental, but deliver a lot of value, which is managing the problem. You, you can't always you know have an um, you know a long term solution so sometimes you need to start with what you have which may mean for example using a tool like data grail to essentially manage uh, compliance it can also mean taking a few fields and using something like scaffold so let's go to the next slide and see what actually netflix did on their own so netflix has as you know thousands of engineers so they essentially put them to use and uh, they basically built what would be considered a privacy data vault. And, and they built all the controls and the tools that go around it from the ability to handle data deletion requests to trying to manage compliance. And you know, if you talk to Jitendra, he'll tell you it took many, many engineers and many, many months to just even get the most basic architecture working. So that's really what the state of the art is. This is what companies like Netflix, Goldman Sachs, Visa, are all moving to and job that Daniel and I have signed up for is to make this easy for everybody else. Yep. Daniel, you want to comment on this so we can- Yeah, I, I, I actually, um, I don't know if I can reverse, of course, we're, we're not gonna be able to reverse, but mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would just comment that I think, yeah, the, the, the ideal state there, there it goes. The ideal state there of, uh, you know, having a central location for, for information, especially for, folks who have, um, you know, probably legacy systems, internal systems that they've built over long periods of time. And those, those pipelines between where information goes, like that starts to become complicated. Um, I won't go to the prior one, but I, I, it, that it was messy. Let's put it that way. Um, I think what, what we also see is just like the proliferation of, of SAS, right? And so um, there's, I, I'm yet to meet a CISO who's been able to explain to me all of the systems that an organization has and what type of personal information exists in those systems. And they're changing all the time because of the workflow and the environment that we're in, right? So even just looking at this, right, we're using Zoom, we could have very easily used Microsoft Teams, right, to operate the same thing. Um, and we see, you know, Teams operate three or four different similar tools within one organization. Um, and that is happening because people are working autonomously, um, not necessarily interacting as much as they were in the past. So this problem is not going to go away. So we will be working on it for the next decade as we go down here. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I think this is sort of like the ideal state. Um, do you want to kind of walk through like what 
what you see is that the problems and we can talk about through these together too as we go through it yeah so i think um, if people really want to get a sense of as you know uh, oftentimes they start with a question pops up at a board meeting saying hey we are going to go public or we are raising our series a or we are yeah. about to enter a new market uh, does anybody here know whether we are compliant with gdpr x. ccpa yeah. x um, sometimes the acronyms themselves can be mind boggling uh, and then as soon as that question pops up you have to basically say okay to comply with any of these laws you have to have an understanding of where your PII is, which is the identification classification problem. Uh, ideally, is there a way for us to isolate this problem, uh, at least for uh, homegrown databases and applications so that we have uh, at some level of control on the PII information. By the way, PII is simply an acronym for personal identifiable information. It basically means social security numbers and credit card numbers is how I think about it, right? So anything that you wouldn't want leaked uh, for your customers, or you don't want to read, get up in the morning and hear about, you know, Equifax having a social security number breach or Robinhood having an email breach, those are all PII feeds. That's all personal information. Um, and then, you know, usually if it's not a top-down conversation at the board level, then sometimes it's as simple as someone coming uh, to your website and emailing you and saying, can you make sure under this law, can you delete my data? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of news has gone there. I think it's probably one of the biggest driving factors that makes people think, oh my God, I need to get a handle on this because it's one thing to be compliant in theory. It's another to actually have a flood of emails coming in saying, can you guarantee to me that you've deleted my data? Anybody here who's tried deleting their Facebook account over the last 10, <laughs> 15 years knows what data deletion request Handling at its best and its worst looks like, depending on what your experience was like. Um, and then you need to, uh, in order to do any of this stuff, you need to protect and manage the PII in your existing applications. You probably have Salesforce, you probably have Marketo, you probably have uh, all these systems. So there's sort of a data layer, which is the databases and Snowflakes and MongoDBs of the world. And then there's your custom SaaS applications uh, like Salesforce and stuff. You need to solve this PII problem both inside your data environments yeah. and also make sure that it's solved for the applications that you're connecting to. And in some ways, the simplest way of thinking about Skyflow and Data Grail is we help you solve the problem within your environments, your databases, applications that you built, and uh, Data Grail helps you manage all the permissions and stuff that you need to handle around uh, applications that you're using. There's an overlap because your internal applications also need controls mm -hmm. and your external applications oftentimes need data to be anonymized and such before it is sent to a system like Salesforce. You may want to, for example, tokenize your credit card numbers. And then finally, I think people worry about access control. Uh, if there is one thing that people can do to solve security oftentimes, the mind, human mind goes to things like very sophisticated things like homomorphic encryption or things like, uh, you know, uh, what if, you know, we could magically do X, Y, Z. But if you think about the actual breaches, they oftentimes happen because the wrong people have access to the data. Like the last week's breach, uh, Daniel, I don't know if you read about it, but basically someone convinced some Robin Hood customer support guy to give them access. Now, the customer support guy yep. should not have had access to 7 to million email addresses. Yes, yes, yes. Right? yes. Yeah, that's an so issue. Yeah. If you look <laughs> I wrote about access, that in Fortune, actually, of like how painful that was. Uh, yeah. Just like, it, it's simple, but it can happen very easily. Yeah. So if you actually limit access control, go back in time for all the breaches we've ever had. In fact, the f Facebook problem was also about access control. Cambridge Analytica wasn't supposed to have that much data. You know, Equifax, the same thing. They had a portal that people just, you know, drain the data from. So if you can limit the access, even your worst problems become much smaller. And then what does it mean to actually have access control and protection and stuff like that? 
there's some sort of governance you need. Governance simply is a fancy word for saying, I know what's going on in my environment where. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And like we talked about a couple of days ago, it's it's sort of like a, a mixture between challenges, right? Because ideally you walk through the problems in the way that you articulated, like that is the ideal path, right? I think understanding the um, requirements of the different regulations that you have, um, that, that should be number one on your first list. Um, but what we often see with folks is, you know, they, they have received someone, uh, someone has sent them an email that says, hey, what information do you have about me? It's not a deletion request. Those are actually like easier, to be honest. Oh. Um, the access requests are the most challenging for businesses because trying to compile the information that, um, you know, your business has collected is actually really hard. Um, it, it, it's commonplace, as I described, of, you know, trying to, trying to figure out what tools you're using and the organization is so painful. Um, and even the CISO, when we engage with security teams, often they don't know um, what systems have been purchased. They know they have a Snowflake environment. They know they have a MongoDB environment. You know, do they have, uh, you know, 10 different versions of Zoom? They have no idea. Um, and so usually what we see is this, the, the ideal path is as we just described, but someone sends a note that says, hey, what information do you have about me? That has a 30 day, you know, time clock um, for folks operating in Europe, if you're trying to comply with the GDPR, or 45 days in, in California, and so these needs to be addressed quite quickly. Um, and so often, you know, folks are scrambling to try to put this together, or they send um, the the bare minimum information to the individual. We see this in a lot of cases, meaning, you know, yes, we have your email address and we have your phone number. Um, well, I know you have a lot more information than that. I mean, most people also know that that's the case, and so. Um, you know, being prepared that you can actually respond to that is, is key. So as we go through next sort of path, I think just, you know, in terms of information, trying to understand the regulations that you, you need to comply with. Um, we have a, a, a compliance checklist on, on the website. Um, you know, you should find that under our resources page. That'll give some guidance around what what you do need to do for different regulations and what you, you know, will need to do on, on forthcoming ones like the CPRA coming to place in 2023. Um, anything else you want to add there resources wise and you that might be helpful for folks? Yeah, I think uh, there is the regulations and then there's the compliances. Uh, yeah. You know, we have, you know, uh, documentation around how do you get PCI compliant and HIPAA yeah. compliant and stuff like that. But yeah, I think, the main thing here is to re recognize that the, it's more than just one thing. It's not yes. always just about transfer or opt out, which yes. is sort of the silly version of, you know, we are all tired of those cookie uh, pop-ups. Uh, yeah. But that's really the lipstick on the peg oftentimes. The reason those notices are sometimes way longer than they need to be is because someone internally hasn't figured out how to actually ask the question in a simpler way because they don't know where their data is. Yeah. So, you know, as we looked at sort of like the, the challenges that most businesses face, like if you think about like that, that order of operations, right, the seven things that we had before, um, really it starts with first understanding what assets do you even have, right? So before you can engage with, you know, any type of partner in privacy, it's, it really starts with like, what is your footprint of systems and applications that contain personal information? So like understanding that first is really where it starts. Um, so this concept of system detection, um, we, we coined this about, about two years ago now or a year and a half ago now. Uh, it is novel, so we have filed patents in this area. Um, I think the, the thought process is that, you know, businesses, if, if they don't know they have a snowflake environment, um, <laughs> they probably should, uh, but, but also, then you can address those different environments once you're aware that they actually exist. Um, and so we go about this in a few different ways, but I, I, I think like setting the standard here, there, there's a manual way of doing this, right? So the manual way, if you're a, a CTO or if you're a, a general counsel, you could go around and ask every team, right? So you could, in, you could survey the different teams and ask them what applications they have and what personal information is contained in those systems. You certainly can do that. It's extremely painful, 
right, to do a, a wide comprehensive survey. Or we've seen teams engage folks like KPMG or P PwC to try to, you know, do a consulting effort to engage the entire organization around what systems and, and personal information exist. Um, we've automated that process. And so happy to kind of talk through that at a later date, but we'll go into, into detail around the fulfillment up the top today of, you know, how you actually get to that point, right? Because if you don't know what you have, you can't really go any further. Um, from a standpoint of like what this looks like in practice, right? So this is just an example of, of one of our customers, Overstock. Um, folks are probably familiar with them. They're based out of Utah. Um, they're, uh, you know, they have wonderful couches, chairs, coffee tables, and so on. Um, but uh, they came to us really with a challenge of, you know, as we described earlier, there is the seven steps, but, you know, straight to number one, because they are, you know, receiving requests from their, their customers and their potential customers to ask, hey, what, if, what type of information do you have about me? Um, and that, that's quite challenging for a business like Overstock because they have been around for, you know, coming out 20 years. And um, in that sense, they've, they've purchased a large number of applications. These types of activities were taking them, you know, significant amount of time to complete, right? So there was um, many different teams involved, right? So they would have to triage out to all of the different application owners. Um, and that in itself was just extremely painful. Um, and so centralizing that down to one person who can then, you know, use technology to query the different environments that, you know, someone has purchased, it just makes it a lot easier. Hey, Daniel, I'm going to play uh, my former CEO now. Yes. What is a DSR? Yeah, so. Uh, yeah. What is it? Not everybody here knows DSR. I know you're yeah, a DSR yeah, yeah. expert. Yes, what, what is a DSR? So a data subject request, think about it as um, an individual, right, that um, has, um, in some cases, a legal right to ask for their information or ask for their information to be deleted or even ask for their information to be transferred to another um, entity. So under GDPR, for example, individuals can ask for um, portability. So meaning their information is ported from your organization to another organization. That's quite painful, as you can probably imagine. Um, this framework of a data subject request carries over to other legal requirements. So California's Consumer Privacy Act has the same concept and same structure, um, meaning as an individual, I'm sure you and I can go and contact Nordstrom and ask them, hey, you know, what information do you have about me? And um, from a regulation standpoint and from a compliance standpoint, the business is required to provide that information. Um, in the GDPR, the context requires a uh, machine readable file. So something that can be read by a machine. Um, we see our customers generally also include some form of, um, you know, PDF or other format in addition to the, the machine readable file to ensure that it can be read by a, a human like us. Um, uh, but yeah, machine readable for GDPR. For California, there's also concepts of do not sell. So this idea of not selling my information, um, this is still often bucketed under the broad umbrella of a data subject request. However, as you can probably appreciate, it has a wider set of requirements, um, meaning do not sell is not just data brokers. I sort of mentioned that twice, not just data brokers. Um, it also includes businesses that may have loyalty programs or may transfer information um, you know, implicitly to other vendors. And then those vendors are actually engaged in the sale of information. It can extend into those areas. And so to determine your legal obligation there, I would advise to consult with legal counsel. We are definitely not legal counsel. Um, I was so going to just say, Daniel, it sounds like a lot of big uh, explanation, but basically uh, if a customer wants to know where their data is and wants to know if it's being sold or not, uh, this is the tool to make sure that you can actually enforce that. And if customers here want to understand more, they should definitely talk to Data Grail. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so maybe we continue. Um, you know, do you want to describe a little bit about, about Skyflow? And I think we have an example here too. Do you want me to, to go to the example? No, <laughs> let me just kick off by yeah, sure. uh, sharing our mission. Uh, so, uh, uh, as some of you may know, we started this company about three years ago. Uh -huh. And it, you know, this, when I started this company, uh, it came out of my experience working at Oracle, which is probably the largest database company in the world uh, to this day. Um, and 
we had this magical product called transparent encryption. And I used to find it amusing because the funny thing is the encryption is transparent, not just to your developers, but it's also oftentimes transparent to the hackers. Uh, mm. it, it helps you comply with some, you know, data encryption laws in some countries, but really doesn't do anything to protect anybody. Um, at Salesforce, we would often run into customers that had millions and millions of rows of customer data, sometimes uh, tens of millions of rows. And sometimes that can, can included sensitive data. And yep. while we have solutions like Stripe for helping you manage your payment infrastructure, Twilio for telephony infrastructure, Auth0 for passwords and usernames, it always seemed weird that we don't have a prepackaged API for solution for developers to just offload this problem to somebody else. And so that's the product that we built. Uh, it comes in three flavors. One is PII Vault, we just explained. Daniel and I spent last half an hour explaining what PII is. So it's literally just a vault with an API for storing, managing, and using your PII so that at all times you know where it is, who has access to it, and how it's governed. Uh, PII can come in other flavors. So let's say if you are uh, running a hospital system or building an app like Robinhood or Coinbase, you may need a payment vault or a fintech vault, you may need a healthcare vault. At the core of it, it's just human beings and their data. Uh, next slide, please. So what do we really want? Uh, we simply want as a... Um, the solution to this whole problem is we simply want the ability that the right people should have access to the right parts of the data. And to do that in a manner that's always controlled and managed and auditable and logged, right? It's not sufficient for you to say, yeah, I think we make sure that our foreign call centers can't see the social security number except uh, if you remember what happened in Mississippi lately, it's just a view source code away from actually being able to detect the whole thing. So doing this right uh, in a manner so that your individual application developers don't have to obsess over exactly the details of how uh, encryption or compliance needs to work. Uh, so goal is what? Someone logs in from a call center, they can only see last four digits of your social security number. Someone logs in from marketing, they can magically actually run a query and say, hey, give me all the accounts we have that have more than $100,000 in balance. And we wanna send out an email to all of them. Can we do all of those things in a manner that's privacy preserving? So that's really the goal of the vault architecture. And then, um, one set of laws that we haven't really dug into in this talk so far is data residency. It's become a huge issue globally. It's impacting now US companies because US companies oftentimes are multinational companies. There's very few US only companies. So what that means is the law essentially requires you to make sure that the data of the consumers is oftentimes physically resident in only data centers that are in those countries. EU has those laws. Sometimes it means you can store the data anywhere, but only citizens of that country can actually legally see it. And sometimes it means that you need to prevent any and all access to foreign citizens. So these are rules that you need to be able to set up, prove and confirm uh, in the context of the use cases. So it's a lot of work. So we've, what we've done is essentially prepackaged all of this for you and built the Skyflow vault. Next slide, please. Uh, so how does it work? It's very simple. Uh, we know what data types that you and I use. It's social security numbers, phone numbers, email addresses. We are a workflow aware, data type aware data store is the best way to think about it. Just like Stripe knows what credit card numbers and taxes are, and Twilio really, really knows what telephony is all about, and Marketo knows what email addresses are, we are experts in PII. What that means is that we've actually thought through the use cases around things like telephone numbers. Like a telephone number is actually funny enough, not a number. Actually, none of these numbers are numbers if you think about it. You will never multiply your social security number by my date of birth and divide it by a telephone number. It makes no sense. What these things are, are very, very powerful, but simple data structures. And what 
our insight at Skyflow when we started the company was, what if we treat them like data structures that they are? If we did that, we can actually do two things. We can prepackage a lot of privacy thinking around these data types. We know, for example, that the last four digits of SSN and telephone numbers is really where a lot of PII sits, less so when it comes to your country code, maybe a little bit more comes to area code. So what that means is we can actually allow your marketing team to run analytics in your Snowflake database across all uh, country codes and uh, region codes, but nobody in those teams has access to the last seven digits of the phone numbers in the US. And then by region by region, it's different numbers. So just imagine having to implement just a simple rule that says marketing team can see the country code and area code and other teams can't. And by the way, if you still need a way to verify the last four digits of your phone number and SSN at a call center. We've taken all of those questions and implemented a polymorphic data encryption, which is simply a way of saying that we've encrypted it in multiple different ways. So we can actually do all of this without decrypting the data. And we've done that by managing a global data store so that you can actually have this data stored in the right place in the right country. Net net is that you now have a simple API. When that API gets called by your application that's being used by call center team, uh, they literally have limited access to, they can only see 100 records a day and they can't see the last four digits. If those rules were in place at companies like Equifax, Marriott and others, the worst key breach they would have had was 100 records per call center breach, uh, rep breach and the first four digits of your phone number. So that's the goal. We want to make it super simple uh, for developers. Next slide. So, you know, why did Nomi help pick us? Well, the answer is very simple. Uh, Bo Hartman is actually a little bit of a legend in his industry. He built the Apple card infrastructure when he was at Goldman Sachs. Um, some of you probably don't know this, but Apple card actually is backed by Goldman Sachs. It's public information. And he not only built the uh, vault for that credit card system at Goldman, but he also built it previously at Barclays and a couple other institutions. So when he saw our product, he was like, oh my God, you can, you can have this out of the box. I wish I could have seen this before. And so he, he was actually one of our earliest, largest customers. And uh, we are very happy to have him because he's not just building a new application. He actually has the experience of having dealt through all the things that we showed in, in the previous diagrams. Uh, similarly, there are companies like uh, Deserve. Uh, there's companies like um, uh, Health IQ who are using our product. Uh, another interesting factoid, uh, the, the guy and gentleman who built the vault at Netflix, you know, he saw a product uh, and emailed me one day and said, this just makes so much sense. I wish this existed so that people could actually use it out of the box. So th that's some of the early feed feedback we've gotten. Uh, you can learn more about our other customers on our website, but let's go forward. So as we kind of like looked at the the broader solutions like how how could we work together and Anshu Sky and myself were talking about we'll we'll put out a blog post on this topic of just like how how customers and how businesses can can look at solving these problems that we've talked about today. There are a whole host of of problems in privacy and I think um, the one comment I would make is you know if a business is articulating that they can solve all the problems, um, I would be very cautious about proceeding because this is a um, this is a very difficult problem set and there are many areas that are unique. Um, and so, you know, even, you know, areas that are expanding beyond what we've talked about today, there are other areas in privacy that both um, Skyflow and DataGrail don't solve. Um, but I think as you look at the, the, the solution set that we're talking about today, um, you know, we're really looking at best and breed partnerships. And I think, you know, what we've talked about today in, in the sort of two areas um, you know, it was articulated on the slide. Um, and as I said, we'll, we'll follow up on, on a blog post in this area too. Um, anything Anshu you want to mention, um, in addition to what we've already covered? Yeah, I think the, the main thing is what you just said. Uh, there are, there are different aspects to all of these problems. Uh, in fact, it's not just uh, data grail and Skyflow. 
uh, you have to think 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 about things like is your authentication systems good enough, yep. right? Yep. Uh, maybe you need to work with Okta or yep. Stitch or someone to make sure your password protection is robust. You need to think about things like the SaaS applications you're buy, buying, are they compliant? But as, as far as PII uh, data is concerned within the four walls of your, I guess four walls is magical four walls, within the four <laughs> walls of your Amazon instance or GCP instance, <laughs> Snowflake instance, or the applications in the four walls of another GCP instance running service now, um, we, you need a set of tools to actually get a handle on this problem and we can work together um, yeah. to help them. Cool. Well, I think we do have a few questions that have come in, Sky, correct? Yes, we do. Thank you, Daniel and Anshu. That was great. Um, if you go to the next slide, we have some resources available for, uh, for you as well. Um, so this one is a bit of a meaty one. It's a two-parter, so I'll ask the first part first. You're presuming that companies know how the data is used, where in legacy systems and on Aunt Sally's laptop. Question one, what's the best practice for legacy systems in a company that performs tasks in departmental silos with different snapshots of data? Yeah, I, I can take a pass on this one, Angie. I'm sure you can color in the lines too. It's, um, it, this, is the, this is the issue, right? The, the, the assumption that people actually know what, what they're doing with the information. Um, I, I, I'm yet to find businesses that actually have a consistent knowledge of what they're using information for. This is actually where people get fined the most um, in terms of frequency for the GDPR as an example. Um, this concept of purpose of processing, which is effectively businesses don't know why they're processing your personal information. Um, and so, you know, starting with a um, data mapping exercise, which really involves, you know, what systems do we have? What is in them? What are these individual systems doing with your personal information? What is the purpose of that processing? Um, that is a wide and colossal effort that businesses need to go through really before they can do anything. That's kind of the, the starting point. Um, and so I, I, would, I, I would agree with the question um, and respond that it, it is actually necessary to do that first before you can proceed with um, really anything further. I think the the flip part of this question is, uh, you know, if Aunt Sally is going to always have access to everybody's social security number at a bank as an employee mm -hmm. or at <laughs> Robinhood or at QFAX, then we are uh, forever, you know, I don't want to use a French word, but basically we are forever screwed. Uh, <laughs> we can't accept the status quo. We cannot just say, look, there are thousands of copies of my social security number probably floating around with every bank that you're working with and such. If we took that defeated approach, then we would not solve anything. The reality is that the, the, the reason Aunt Sally is downloading that information is because your databases don't have no controls. Your SaaS applications yeah. have no controls in place. So if you actually had controls in place working with Data Grail on your SaaS applications, Aunt Sally wouldn't be able to download everything because there would be controls in place, presumably. If you were using a PI vault, uh, even if you downloaded everything, the data would be redacted. You're, yeah. You shouldn't be creating copies of the data. The whole purpose of a vault is, you know, copy by reference, not by value, right? Just like before Google Docs, we are all familiar with Google Docs, right? Remember when we were trying to put together spreadsheets before Google Docs existed? Your company's budget, you're emailing it back and forth to hundreds of people. Everybody has a copy now. And I have seen at least a few HR disasters where the HR person sent out uh, everybody's bonus and salary because they thought they had hidden it Wait. while just doing a filter. Yeah. Every company, I think recently Microsoft had one incident which was very public about a bunch of people's salary getting collected and stuff. But we can't expect, uh, you know, Joe or Sally, not to be sexist, to be able to figure out what a filter inside Excel sheet looks like. What we have to do is put controls in place and your databases and your SaaS applications have to be secured by default. And then you go buy out, you know, you can go buy endpoint security tools. And that's, 
in some ways, the question's answer is there's $100 billion worth of security industry that chases that question today. I will make sure your laptop is more secure. I will make sure your laptop has better single sign-on. But what Daniel and I are trying to do is saying, we have to look beyond the status quo and solve the problem at its core. Yeah. Next question, please. Right, thanks. Yeah, we're about to um, approach time. So if you want to go to the next slide, we have uh, Dan Daniel and Anshu's contact info, um, and we'll also reach out to you with answers for those that we don't get to. Um, next question, my company already has a robust architecture built, connections with a wide variety of apps and set procedures in place. What's the first step you'd recommend to reevaluate our architecture specifically with data privacy in mind? So if it's an architecture question, I would say, if you have a robust architecture in place, do you have controls and governance in place? The question that I'd be asked earlier, uh, do you know where your PI is? Do you know, what can your customer support representative see? Do you know what your customer su support representative in Bangalore see versus in Philippines mm -hmm. versus Phoenix see? Um, if I run a report inside your BI tool, and said, give me everybody's bank balance of greater than 100,000. Does it also reveal social security numbers and phone numbers? If the answer, most likely the answer to that question is some of those things are not correctly set up. And then you have to ask the question, where is that data? So once you've figured out what are the loose, you know, kind of like you're testing the tightness of your solution. When you start seeing that something is cracking, then you basically say, is that, uh, customer support representative able to see social security numbers because we didn't encrypt it in our data vault? Or is it happening because my service now instance is not correctly set up? And you know, both uh, Data Grail and Skyflow will be happy to talk to you guys and, and, and give you yeah. some pointers there. Great, well, we are at time. Thank you so much, Daniel and Anshu, and thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we will send out a recording of this webinar within 24 hours or so. And uh, we'll see you next time. Indeed. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Anshu. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Great fun. Thank you. Mm -hmm. See ya.